my prayer and my heart is that as we dig into this uh, topic of spiritual gifts and we dive into this, that you would begin to discover the giftings that God has given you as a follower of Jesus. You would discover the giftings God has given you. Uh, we would begin to develop in those giftings and then deploy. I want you to remember these three words, discover, develop, and deploy. Discover, develop, deploy. That's what we want to do. We want to discover the giftings that God has given us. We want to develop in those, and then we want to deploy. We want to go out, and we want to walk in them. We want to walk in the giftings the Holy Spirit has given us, and that's what we're focusing on uh, here in this, uh, in this series, discovering what position you are on the team. Because let me, let me just tell you here this morning, as a follower of Jesus, you're on the team. Did you know that? Did you know that you are a part you are on the team. You are a part of the body of Christ. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you to use your giftings. Here's a point I want to make here today. There are no sideline fans on Jesus' team, only players. You know, when I was, uh, when I grew up, I was, I played baseball my whole life. And I remember there was a season, uh, there was a, I mean, from, from the time I was six years old, playing baseball, and just got into that and played baseball, baseball, baseball. Then I got a little bit older, and I kind of started moving over and played more football. The coaches were kind of like, hey, listen, you're a big guy. Like, put some focus on football here. It might do you well. So I did, and I closed a chapter on baseball, right? And then I started playing football, and I loved it. I loved to play sport. I loved to play football. Did that for years, and I can remember, and then I played my last football game where I, there, there's a season where you're no longer a player, right, in sports, but you become a fan. Let me just tell you, that never happens on Jesus' team. Yeah. There's never a season where I'm just going to be a fan this season. Yeah. I'm just going to take, I'm just going to be a sideline, you know, God, I, I'm here, I'm rooting for you on the side. There are only players on team Jesus, amen? amen? And God has given you gifts. He has given you giftings that you and I are to use to build up, to edify the church, the body of Christ, God is not calling us to a life of spiritual spectator. You're called to be an active participant in the kingdom of God. Each and every one of us have a calling on our life. God has a purpose for you, unique gifting that he's given you. I want you to hear me on this today. And I want to, I want to start by reading 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read through these eight verses. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, if you brought your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. Uh, we're going to read verses 12 through 20. And I want you to hear the theme in this and what Paul is saying. He says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For, uh, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Listen to this. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. The body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make any less a part, make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? I want you to hear this last verse, verse 20. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Many parts, yet one body. We make up the body of Christ. There are many parts. Christ is the head of the church. Right? But, but, but what he's saying here is this, is that there are, many, there are many different members, many different parts that make up the body, right? M many different functions. Like he says, you know, I mean, your, your eyes don't smell, and there's a reason for that. Your feet don't hear, right? Uh, and, and if your feet were like, well, why can't I hear? They're not functioning in the gifting or in the, in the operation that they're intended to function in. So here's the model. I want you all to see this here this morning. This is the model that's set for the body of Christ to go out to do what? For the mission of God. Here's the idea. If we're going to fulfill the mission God has given us, as Velocity Church, if we're going to walk in the calling that God has put on our church to walk in. If we're going to do it effectively, we've got to do it 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We have to operate in this way. The body of Christ, 
everybody using their giftings that the Holy Spirit has given them to go out and to walk in that and to operate in that. Amen. One body, many members. One body, many members. So here's my question today. We're talking about spiritual gifts. What is a spiritual gift? You know, ask that question, and, and some of you, you're probably thinking of a whole lot of things. You know, what, what, what is a spiritual gift? What, what, what are we talking about here this morning? As a matter of fact, let me, let me just say this too. When we talk about spiritual gifts, there might be some people in here who red flags start going up. Uh, maybe you're in here today and you're like, I hear spiritual gifts. And I'm like, man, whew, I've had some experiences in some church circles. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm a little bit cynical when I start hearing you talk about the move of the Holy Spirit. And, whoo, you know, you start thinking back of, of you know, the, the certain, you know, something you saw on TV, you know, or something like that. You know, a pastor looks like lost in a paintball war. You know, telling you, give all the money that you have to the, you, you know what I'm saying? And, and you're, you're going to walk in this, you're going to walk in that. And you start getting this negative idea of what, what it means to, be, to live empowered by the Holy Spirit and to walk in that. And here's what I would just say, just from the get-go, just to set aside any of that kind of thinking that we're walking into. Don't allow a negative experience from a church or that maybe you ran into with some, some, some people. Don't allow a failure of walking in the gifts of the Holy Spirit to make you, um, to make you dismiss it and say, oh, it's, it's just not for me. Just, just not for me. You know, oh, we're talking about Holy Spirit over here. You know, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, churches that won't really dive into this uh, just because, you know, it, sometimes when people start talking about the Holy Spirit, people get all sp spookified. <laughs> oh, man, what are you going to talk about? What are you, oh, no, 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 you know. What, what, what do we hold to? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. That's right. Amen. Amen. And we're to allow the giftings of the Holy Spirit to operate um, in the body of Christ. So, what is a spiritual gift? I want to give you a little analogy. Just want to think about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are like tools in the Holy Spirit's toolbox. There are different tools for different tasks. Okay, and so like a mechanic um, will have different tools than a doctor. You know, a dentist is going to have some different tools than a pharmacist is going to use. A construction worker is going to probably use some different tools than you're going to find in a local garage. Although we do live in Brenham, so <laughs> maybe not. Well, the, the point is this. There are a variety of, of tools uh, for a variety of tasks. Different tools needed for different tasks. And so it's the same way. It's how our giftings work. This is how the body of Christ works. It's a variety of tools, variety of giftings that the Holy Spirit empowers his people with for the mission of God to go out and to do his work. So this is what 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, 4 through 7, it says this. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Somebody say the same Spirit. Same spirit. <clears throat> there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what? For the common good. You notice the pattern in that is different giftings, but same Spirit. Different gifts, same Spirit. The source is the Holy Spirit. He is the source. And so the giftings that you have, and please hear me on this today, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been given gifts by the Holy Spirit to operate in the kingdom of God, for the advancement of the kingdom of God here on earth, by the Holy Spirit. I mean, is that just, just thinking about that for a moment, does that just amaze you, right? Just thinking, I have been given gifts, uh, gifts and tools for the Holy Spirit power of God to work in me and through me to be on mission with God. You hear what we're talking about here this morning? It's not just, you know, casual conversation. I mean, we're, we're talking about to go out the Great Commission. Uh, different gifts, same spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers the church through various gifts he gives. And here's, here's the key here. Why does the Holy Spirit empower the church with different gifts? What does it say? For the common good. It's for building up. Why do we have these spiritual giftings? It's for building up. It's edifying the body. To build up the body to go out and advance God's kingdom here on earth. So in the coming weeks, I just want to tell you, 
you know, we're going to dig more into uh, specifics in some of the spiritual giftings as we dive into this series. But it's, it's, it's important for us to know this. Now, I want to address two theological words here this morning that you've probably heard. If you've been in church circles before, you've probably heard these words get thrown out there before. But these are big decisions that we have to, uh, we have to talk about. And so, uh, two words, continuationism and cessationism. Or you might say someone says they're a continuationist or a cessationist. Okay, I'm going to give you a brief couple definitions of what this means and why this is important for us to, to know this. Cessationist, essentially, this is a brief, uh, brief little definition of what they believe, believes that all sign gifts have ceased. A continuationist would believe that the gifts have not ceased and the Holy Spirit is still at work today working in and through the body of Christ. These are two different ways of going about. This is why this is such a massive decision to come to and to know, you know, where do we stand on this? Because this is really going to influence how the church moves forward and how we operate in, in, in the kingdom of God. And so this is important for us to note. So I want to read to you the scripture that is the most debated when it comes to these two uh, theological words here this morning. And um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 8 through 12, this is where a lot of the conversation is had. It starts off by saying, love never ends. Love never, love continues. Love is going to continue. Our God does not just do love. He does not just love. Our God is love. Amen? Love continues. Love continues. Listen to what it says. As for prophecies, they will what? They will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. So this is where a lot of the debate comes. Verse 10, but when the perfect comes, underline that, the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When the perfect comes, a cessationist would say that the interpretation that they take from when the, when the perfect comes would be at the close of the canon of Scripture, uh, that we have the perfect Word of God, and that's the, they would say that, okay, when that happened, that the giftings were really, the signs and giftings were just for a time, they were for the startup of the church. And that's what cessationism believes, that's what a cessationist will say, that they interpret the perfect comes being with the perfect Word of God. And although the Word of God is perfect, the context of 1 Corinthians, we got to read into it because that's not what it's referring to. It's not referring to the perfect Word of God. So I'm going to read on, okay? This is why it's important to read in Scripture to not just take a snippet out and go, well, it says that tongues will cease, and it says that prophecies will pass away, and, and it says that knowledge will pass away, so I, I guess it did. It's, it's a timeline question. We've got to read into what it's saying. So you've you got to keep reading the full context of the passage, and a lot of people stop there, and they go, the perfect comes, and then... And then people will use that for justification to say, well, the giftings just don't happen anymore, right? They're not operating. Verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly. But then, somebody say, but then. But then. Face to face. Can you underline that in your Bible? But then, face to face. But then, face to face. What are we referring to here? The second coming of Jesus. That's what we're referring to here. But then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So here's the question. Will the gifting cease? Yes, but in a future day. At the second coming of Jesus. When we see Jesus face to face. And when we know fully, and there are no longer any needs for the giftings, because Jesus has returned. Yeah, this is why it's so important for us to read into the context. And so you ask Velocity Church, where do y'all stand? We're continuationists. We believe in uh, the giftings are still here, that the Holy Spirit has still empowered uh, believers to operate in those giftings, uh, to advance God's kingdom here on the earth, that he's working in us and through the body of Christ to go out for the mission of God. That's where we stand. And this is why it's such an important place to, to go. And we have to ask questions about this. I, I want to read to you Acts chapter 2, verse 17. It says, and in the last days it shall be. 
God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Last days, I will pour, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. 1 Peter uh, 4 says, the end of all things is at hand. That we're in the last, so we're talking about the end times, the last days. We're living in those days. We're living in the time of God has poured out his spirit on all flesh. So we're in that time. So the Holy Spirit, hear me on this this morning, church, is active and he's alive and he's working and he is working in uh, broken, imperfect people who don't have it all together for the mission of God. And we got we to know that and we've got to approach it in that way and understanding as we move forward and what it means to live spirit-filled and filled by the Spirit. And what does this mean then? We have to we have to talk about, okay, if this is the model, this is the mission, this is where the focus is, this is massive. Then in order for the church to operate the way God intends, it takes the whole body. It takes the whole body saying, God, how have you, what have you, what have you gifted me in? What giftings have you given me? In? And, and, and how can I develop in those giftings, God? How can I use my gifting you've given for the advancement of the kingdom. That's, that's in church, but that's also just out in ministry, in your life ministry, just wherever that you're operating, uh, you're operating in your giftings that God has given you. So next, next question I want to ask is, what does it mean to live spirit-filled? What, what does it mean to live spirit-filled? Filled by the Holy Spirit. We're, we're, it means that we're living in such a way as to, we are intentional about hearing the voice of God and, and operating in the giftings that God has given us. And we're intentional, intentional about obeying the voice of God and, and, and operating in that gifting. And so we live led by the Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit. Um, I want to show you a picture, Matthew chapter 3. 16 through 17, this is Jesus is baptized. It says, uh, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And what happens? Behold, the heavens were opened up to him, were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus, he's baptized. Now here's an important thing to note here is that up until this point, there are no previous recording miracles of Jesus. He hasn't started his ministry yet. The ministry, Jesus' ministry hasn't kicked off yet. What happens right after this moment? So Jesus baptized, the, the heavens open up, the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. What immediately happens? The Spirit leads him into the wilderness. He's tempted by Satan for 40 days. Tempted by Satan for 40 days in the wilderness. <clears throat> tempted in all things. I, I want to read to you what, he, what, what does Hebrews say? We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. What does that mean? Jesus was tempted by all the, th everything, all the things that you feel the temptation, the weight of temptation. Jesus felt the pressure. When Jesus is in the garden, before he goes to the cross, the Bible says that He's praying, and there's so much stress, and there's so much pressure that his pores begin to, uh, blood begins to come out of his pores, and he's feeling the weight of going to the cross and what's, what's coming. He's feeling the pressure of all that. Jesus felt temptation. A lot of people think, well, temptation is a sin. Giving in to the temptation is a sin. When you, when you give in to the temptation, Jesus felt the weight. If, if people aren't careful, what they can do is they say, well, Jesus is God. Yes, Jesus is God. But he didn't lean into his deity to cheat, okay? He didn't lean into his deity on earth to make things easier for himself when he was feeling pressure. Because he's setting a, an example. He's setting a model for us. Right after he's, he's baptized, the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. He's driven into the wilderness. And then at that point, we see Jesus' ministry begin. He starts, he gathers disciples. He starts preaching. He starts teaching. He goes out. People begin, uh, he begins healing people. But all of this, all this comes after uh, the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. 
Jesus is setting an example for us. That's, that's the picture here. Jesus modeled spirit-filled living. That's the point I want you to hear this morning. Jesus modeled what it looked like to live uh, led by the Spirit. Again, Hebrews, we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. In every respect, he's been tempted as we are yet without sin. So he felt all that temptation, but never sinned. If we're not careful, we can dishonor what Christ did by, by saying, well, he, he's, he's God, so it's easier for him. Don't do that. It wasn't. He, he felt the weight. He felt the pressure. When he's being nailed to the cross, he felt the pain. He went through all that. He endured all that, yet without sin. Yet without sin. Jesus modeled spirit-filled living. Set an example for you and I for how, how, are you, how are we to live here on the earth? How are we supposed to go out and how are we operating uh, led by the Holy Spirit? So what does it mean to live spirit-filled? Simply, it means to live more like Jesus. You look more like Jesus. You, you, you operate in life more like Christ. And that's the goal, right? That's the goal. Become more like Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 this is so important. I, I don't. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 19 through 21. This is what it says. Verse 19 Do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. That we are to not quench the Holy Spirit from working in this church. We are not to stop God from moving the way He wants to move in this church. And if we're not careful, we can get in routines, we can get in modes, we can get in our own head, all of us get in our own head of how this is going to happen, how that's going to happen, and this is going to happen in all our plans, and we, we, we miss something that God is wanting to do, okay? We, we're to not quench the Holy Spirit. Uh, verse 20, do not despise prophecies. We're not to despise prophecies, right? If, God, if you have the gift of prophecy, God speaks to you, God gives you a word, you bring it to the elders of the church, let the elders of the church confirm it, right? Verse, verse 21 says, this is key, but test everything. <laughs> so I want you to see right, right, right now what we're talking about. We're to not quench the spirit, we're to not despise prophecies, but we are to test everything. So what does that mean? That means that Sunday mornings don't turn into, you know, open mic, past the mic, and, you know, thus saith the Lord. I, I think God said this. You, you, you follow me here this morning? Just because somebody says it's a word from the Lord doesn't mean it's a word from the Lord. Amen. So we're to test everything. Uh, it's not always the Holy Spirit that's, that's guiding in that. It might be, you know, another spirit that's guiding somebody to say something. I remember a, a, a pastor, a story that I heard uh, of a pastor early on in ministry. Uh, somebody stood up in the service and they said, you know, I've got a word. I've got a word to share. And the pastor, who's younger in ministry, is like, all right, go ahead and share it. Passes the mic to him. And the woman goes, I just want to tell everyone that God is lonely and, and he's, missing, he's missing his people. And, and, and <laughs> where the pastor had, well, hold on a second, wait a second. Didn't think that one through, grab the microphone. Let's clean that up. God is not lonely, okay? Despite what you may believe, God is very okay with himself, uh, you know? Uh, he's a relational God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I mean, they're eternal. Uh, they have, you know, eternally been. So, um, so the, the point is this, is that, you know, we, we don't, we don't turn Sunday morning into a, uh, a practice ground for testing out the gifts. Y'all hear me on that this morning? Uh, we, we create space to develop in the giftings that we have, but we test everything, but we don't quench the spirit. We allow the Holy Spirit. We say at, at our church a lot that we're a spirit filled church, but we're not thrill seekers or moment chasers. Okay. We're not, we're not seeking a thrill. We're not, woo, let's ride on that. We're not moment chasers. We desire authentic encounters from God, the Holy Spirit. 
We want God to move in this church. We want authentic encounters from God the Holy Spirit to move in this body and in this church to do whatever it is God wants to do. And that is our heart, and that's where we're at. We want to be a church that lives led by the Spirit of God and all the decisions that we make at Velocity, that we, as we move forward, decisions that, that are prompted by the Holy Spirit to say, yeah, go ahead and walk through that door and go ahead and walk that way and yes to this and no to that and no to that and yes to that. And we can live Spirit-filled. We can live led by the Spirit of God. We have to test everything. We have to test everything. Amen. We've got to learn to discern the voice of the Lord in our lives. Uh, the primary way we hear God's voice is through his word. So when you know his word, you, you know him and you know his voice. If you want to know the language of God, you've got to learn the word of God. He'll never contradict his word. So when a thought shows up in your life that contradicts this, it's not from God. It's not the Holy Spirit guiding you to do that. It's not the Lord leading you in that way. We learn his word. The Bible says the Holy Spirit brings us in remembrance of his word. He brings us remembrance of all things. And so you're in a difficult season in your life. You're going through a challenge. You're going through a a trial, difficult season. The Holy Spirit will remind you in the middle of that season what his word says. We're to take every thought captive and do what? Make it obedient to Christ. How can you make something obedient to Christ if you don't know the promise, if you don't know the word, if you don't know the truth? And this word is the truth. This is the primary way God speaks to us. And so we we dig into God's word. We live led by the Holy Spirit. We're guided by the Holy Spirit. And we don't quench the spirit of God from moving and from working in the body of Christ. And um, I actually, I want to to bring up Dustin. Would you mind coming up here this morning? I asked Dustin if he could share. There's um, something that happened last week during service. And I want to let him share this testimony here this morning. I thought it was incredible when I heard about it. And I asked him, I asked him a little late this week, but I said, Dustin, would you mind coming up and sharing? And he was like, yeah, I would. So thank you for doing this, Dustin. And yeah. Thank you, Bubba. Yes, sir. So, uh, I'm not sure speaking from my heart is maybe one of my spiritual gifts. (laughs) Arlene could probably vouch for me on that, but, uh, I am excited to be able to get up here and share this story with you guys. So, um, a couple years ago, we sold our house, you know, right outside of Houston, and we decided to go to Columbus and try to build our own house. And while we were working on it, we were trying to save as much money as we could. So I was doing a lot of the, the work around the house myself. And in the meantime, I strained my thumb or injured my thumb somehow and kind of lost the ability to be able to really ex- extend it so much. So, and it became painful to kind of do anything. So. I never realized really how much I used my thumb until I kind of lost the ability to really do it. Things like, you know, just tying my shoe were all of a sudden like a major chore. And uh, I would say for like, for a year afterwards, you know, I kept working it myself, trying to do what I could to get it better and better. And uh, really didn't make any progress. And then last weekend, you know, I was getting ready to get baptized. So there was a lot going through my mind, through my heart. I was in a real special place that day. Um, I feel like when I came into church that day, um, the worship team just really lit me up when they sang that Lion of Judah song. My heart was like, you know, really getting active. And then uh, when Pastor Arthur started talking about, I don't remember the exact words, but it was something along the line of like, you know, Jesus can rescue really any area of our lives. All of a sudden, like my thumb kind of popped and then I could like extend it all the way. And it was a feeling that I hadn't had in, in, you know, like I said, at least a year. And I'd been trying to do it myself and work through it. And uh, all of a sudden, like, I don't know, just something in my heart just told me it was, you know, God working that day, just doing something special for me. And then uh, I went and got baptized. And, you know, a lot of you guys were there to witness that. And it was just really a, a special day for me. And just like looking back on it, it's just uh, kind of incredible what's really going on at this church, you know, between the worship and the message and everything. I th- feel like it just put my heart in a place where I could just really for a brief period of time, like really glorify God and just the way it worked out. Like he showed me a small bit of his power and it was, you know, just in that brief moment, it was more than I, w- I was able to do like in a full year trying to Amen. do it on my own. So Amen. it was really special. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you, Dustin. Appreciate it, brother.
a good man. Thank you. Thank you. That's oh, incredible, man. I mean, and, and I, I, I asked us to share that this morning. Uh, it was when I heard that the first time. I was just, I was just so encouraged, you know, by his testimony and him sharing that that God is, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I mean, God is the same. He's, he's working in us and he's working through us. And, and we're, we're to not quench the spirit of God in this church. We're, we're to let, let the Holy Spirit move and. And if he wants to heal people, he's going to heal people. And, and, uh, and, and we're, we're believing for that here. We believe and we lean into that with you here this morning. Um, there might be people here today and, and you're here and you're like, man, I've, I'm, I, I've, I've been dealing with something similar. Maybe, maybe uh, that Dustin's dealing with or, or maybe something else in your life that you're going through. And I just want you to know that we lean in with you, believing that God answers prayers, believing that God uh, he, he'll work in us. He'll work through us. He works through this body and that he can move in that way. Amen. Can we just give God one more <laughs> praise in here for that? Awesome. I don't, I don't want to just, you know, breeze by that. Such incredible testimony. Thank you again, Dustin, for sharing that this morning. That's edifying the body here this morning. That's building up the church. It's encouraging the body of Christ.